This morning, the world woke up to find out, to everyone's shock, that the Brexit vote not only passed in the UK, but it passed handily by a margin of 52 to 48 percent, roughly. Here to help us make sense of it all and whether Brexit is libertarian and good for libertarianism is our own Ryan McMakin, the editor and publisher of Mises.org and a frequent author at that site. So stay tuned for a great and rollicking interview with Ryan McMakin on Brexit. Well, Ryan McMakin, welcome to Mises Weekends. I don't think you've been a guest before, am I correct? That's right, I've not been. Well, so we wake up this morning, actually stayed up quite late last evening watching BBC and other news sources on the Brexit vote. Definitely came as a surprise and a shock to me, especially the 5248 numbers uh, at the end of the tally. Do you think that this is actually what it's being touted as, as potentially the beginning of the end of the EU and, and a strike against globalism generally, or do you think that's too facile? Are we making too much of it, perhaps in our in our libertarian aspirations in the West? Well, I think maybe we're making too much of it in the sense of that uh, victory has been achieved, uh, but I do think it throws certainly a monkey wrench in the plans of uh, centralizing Europeans. It has highly symbolic value. It is problematic. It encourages other countries to hold their own referendums. Uh, I think in terms of practice, Central banks will find their own way to work around it. Governments will find their own way to work around it. But it does put up some barriers to the unification that uh, European elites wanted. Well, there's hand-wringing going on, though. There are members of the European Parliament saying, oh, my gosh, this means that within five years, the EU will be done. And, uh do you agree with that? Well, EU was already in deep trouble in a variety of ways. The Schengen zone was already falling apart after the uh, French terrorist incidents. And uh, the border guards went back up. People were already declaring uh, Schengen dead, which was a key component of the mm. EU overall. Uh, there are some parts of the EU that, of course, don't want to go anywhere. The receiver states like Ireland, uh, like Greece, like Poland. Uh, yes, Greece uh, has complained a lot about uh, the way the EU does business, but they've been huge beneficiaries in terms of the money that flows out of the creditor states like Greece, France, and the UK and flows to the poorer states. So it's for them, that's a nice little system they got set up. And uh, so I don't think they're going to give that up that easily. Uh, so it, it will, uh, the EU will definitely have to change. Will it just simply dry up and blow away? Well, I'm not convinced of that yet. Well, today we're seeing some turmoil in the markets. We're seeing the British pound lose value relative to other currencies, but that's about it. If an actual Eurozone country was to leave the EU, like France, for instance, as Marine Le Pen has threatened, that would require logistically and technically a lot more. You'd have to revive the French franc. I mean, that seems to me a much more daunting task to have an actual Eurozone country leave than, than it is to have Britain leave. Yeah, it was a much less of a big deal for the UK because they were wise enough to keep their own currency. So yeah, if you're the French, <laughs> you gotta you gotta reintroduce the franc. I mean, that's that would be a big deal. So yeah, there are much bigger obstacles for those countries. Plus, those countries have always been just more wedded to the EU project going back to the 50s, whereas the UK was something of a of a late joiner. Um, and on top of that, the UK is, in fact, richer uh, than France. Now, not richer than Germany. And I, I think you could uh, make the, the case that maybe France benefits more from being in the EU, yeah, gives them more influence. But when we look at the UK, right, the fourth or fifth largest economy in the world, a huge military, all their own, they just simply really didn't need the EU. I think it was much easier to make a convincing case in that way, and it wasn't going to change their monetary system in the way that you would have to change it if you were uh, one of the Eurozone countries. So yeah, it would be a bigger deal for one of these uh, continental countries. But in terms of symbolism, the meaning of the Brexit vote, I'm searching my memory. It, it, let's say modern progressivism and and the be, the beginnings of modern globalism began in the World War One era, coming out of World War One. Can you think of a single time? Since then, that there has been such a momentous vote sort of against uh, 
the forward progress of globalism or, or what we would call a global agenda? Well, of course, the, the good example, the example I always think of as the best case scenario for massive liberalization and decentralization is the collapse of the Soviet Union in the, uh, the Eastern Bloc, of course. Now, no, that wasn't part of the Western globalization uh, effort, but it certainly was part of a major effort at centralization, which failed miserably. And that was a relatively bloodless move away from that. So that's always something that gives me hope that uh, the world can, in fact, uh, uh, move to a place where things get decentralized, where people things move out from the center, where you're offered more variety, where uh, local culture prevails over massive state control from the outside or from the inside. So it happened the one time. Uh, and it wasn't in the West, uh, you know, the way we think of the West necessarily, but it happened in Europe. And uh, so it, it, it happens every now and then. Right. And it happened without voting, but it also happened without bullets. Yes. So that, that's a happy thing. So when you mentioned decentralization, I have to point out that some libertarians tend to be suspicious of secession movements. They tend to be suspicious of decentralization as a tactical or legal approach to reducing the power of states in our lives. Now, in some senses, they say, well, gee whiz, what if the resulting localized government is actually more left-wing or more statist than the more multinational or globalist government it replaces? We hear this argument quite a bit. From my perspective, and certainly from the perspective of Murray Rothbard, and I think from the perspective of Ludwig von Mises, decentralization uh, moving self-determination closer and closer to the individual level is ever and always a good thing. Uh, so talk about how some DC Beltway libertarians disagree and, and, and what you think they mean. Well, I, I've never quite understood uh, their position because the, the theoretical superiority of the other side is so overwhelming. We, we, we don't have to rely even just on uh, Rothbard and Mises, of course. Uh, Louis Rouenet did a great article recently uh, called the How the EU is Anti-European, and he looked at uh, this European tradition of how decentralization, uh, especially in terms of economic policy, is what created the quote-unquote European miracle. And uh, Ralph Rako, of course, was one of his sources. Rako did a long essay on this, looking at how the key to Europe becoming prosperous, to becoming more free, was the fact that unlike any other place, Europe had never managed to attain uh, large dominant states, a single large dominant state uh, within Europe. That as princes attempted to raise taxes and control the population more, the small size of countries in Europe allowed people to easily escape, to get away, to move their capital elsewhere. And it was this variety, this decentralization that made Europe what it is today in terms of freedom and prosperity. And so the decentralization model is what leads to more freedom because it allows escape. It allows more immigration. The worst possible model is, of course, one giant world megastate where you can never leave and there's nowhere to get out. But it's, it seems that the uh, that some libertarians seem to think that 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 is, in fact, the model that we'll have one giant state that can guarantee freedom everywhere. And we'll have some sort of democracy, I guess, that uh, would ensure that this would happen. Um, it's not quite clear how they think that's supposed to happen. I guess uh, they would have Supreme Court of Enlightened Philosopher Kings that would hand down good laws all the time and cancel out the bad laws. That's just an extremely naive position. And uh, it, the, re the greatest check on government power is the fact that there are other options, there are other places to move. And this is all the more important and powerful and, and uh, apparent to see in places where there are a large number of medium and small size countries so that you can in fact leave. Once you start to move to mega states and exit becomes nearly impossible, uh, then you have essentially no limits then on the state's ability uh, to expand its power. We are going to post a link to this article, Ryan, Nations by Consent, Decomposing the Nation State. Actually, one of the last scholarly articles Murray Rothbard wrote, and he's talking not so much about the economic analysis. He's talking not so much about the economic analysis, but more about libertarian political theory. And he really sort of changed his perspective or his outlook on the idea of nations and borders and culture and what it all meant towards the end of his life. In other words, he, he subtly in it criticizes uh, the 
the notion that libertarians focus only on the individual and never view that individual in the context of that individual's birthplace or family or religion or language or culture. Um, so g give us your thoughts on what how this impacts what's happening in Europe and how it impacted Brexit. Well, certainly, yes, I think I would agree with Rothbard that we should not take the naive view of uh, of interhuman relations. This idea that uh, either you're an individual and your only relationship is with the state. Um, and, and when you look at that, well, clearly that's nonsense. Right? People have relationships with all sorts of groups, their families, their religious group, their ethnic group. And uh, I do not take the naive view of, of ethnic relations or religious relations. I assume that there are conflicts between these groups. In fact, I've done uh, quite a bit of writing on Mises.org about here in America and also in Latin America, inter-ethnic conflict, because this is a real issue. And if you ignore it, um, you just end up kind of looking silly. And so it exists in Europe as well, of course. We just simply have to accept that language barriers are real, that proximity is real. And I think that's what the uh, the British recognized as well, is that, yes, we certainly should not take the Brexit vote as some sort of vote for uh, laissez-faire or anything like that. But I think the British recognized on a certain common sense level that people in Britain should maybe make the laws that govern people in Britain, uh, that maybe the people in Britain should actually have a vote to uh, remove uh, people who do things they don't want, then maybe laws should be made in London instead of somewhere on the continent. And the London issue is relevant because you can take a train to London fairly easily. It's closer. It's easier to access. And everyone there speaks English. This is different than going to Brussels and trying to influence policymakers there. Those things make a real difference. And this is these realities have guided many revolutions and uprisings and political movements in the past. And ignoring them is just plain silly. Well, it's more than silly, though. It goes to this argument that so many people have that libertarians are naive with respect to human nature. And I think there is an element within the libertarian movement that tends to talk in ways that sound like globalism, globalism or universalism, right? That we're all going to be these economic actors and we're going to just live in a digital world where we pick up and move to Singapore to, at a moment's notice because the industry or job skill, which we spent many years developing, has been uh, blown up by new technology and that we're all going to live in this uh, ever-shifting world of technology, which sounds an awful lot like a European technocrat as much as it does a libertarian. Well, this, all, this plays into so many stereotypes of libertarians that the left likes to bring up, right? The left likes to point out that this whole idea that people are really just economic actors is obviously wrong, and they're right. That is a good critique of libertarians to suggest that. And that has long been a leftist, uh, something that leftists has pointed out, is that this idea that uh, people uh, form a country and then they only have economic relations just simply has no example in reality whatsoever. So if that's ever going to happen, it has no precedent in human history. And then, of course, just this, it, this this idea of homo economicus that, of course, has long been debunked, that apparently some libertarians still cling to, that uh, people are uh, going to simply pursue their uh, economic self-interest, then they're going to vote only with their pocketbooks. These are simply untrue. In fact, if that were true, I think perhaps uh, Britain would have never voted the way it did. Clearly, there's going to be a short-term effect, I think, to the pocketbook. Uh, because uh, Europe is going to attempt to uh, maybe exact a little bit of revenge on the UK and so on. But uh, in the long term, uh, I don't think it's going to make that much of a difference. However, people went ahead with it because they had cultural, religious, uh, linguistic concerns that rose even above their simple economic concerns. Ryan, you bring up the left, which is one of my favorite topics. It seems that people on the left in the West are always centralizers. They always believe in vesting power in Washington, D.C. or beyond that in the U.N. or in the IMF or in Brussels. But yet they call themselves Democrats. And at each stage, the individual's power to affect uh, the outcomes or to affect those who would purport to govern him or her become more and more attenuated, right? It's easier to lobby your state house than it is to lobby D.C. It's easier to lobby D.C. than it is to lobby the IMF for example. Uh, but here's the conundrum. The left hates 
the idea of states' rights. They hate the Tenth Amendment. That sounds like neo-Confederacy to them. They hate decentralization movements like Brexit. But yet, if they were really serious about their progressive aims, I argue they could have virtually everything they want here and now as long as they were willing to accept that it would be geographically limited. In other words, what if California, Sacramento is dominated by progressives in the legislature. What if California said, screw you, federal government, screw you, Brexit, screw you, Donald Trump, or even screw you, Hillary. We are going to begin today enacting the whole panoply of progressive desires. We're going to have single payer health care in California. We're going to have very high progressive tax rates. We're going to have a very much more generous welfare state. We're going to have open borders. We're going to have draconian gun control. We are going to have social justice warrior social policies put into law. We are going to have unrestricted access to abortion, these kinds of things. Is Obama, is Hillary, is Trump going to send in the federales to enforce a federal law that preempts these things? I don't think so. In other words, why don't progressives who claim to want what they want actually support as a tactical measure decentralization and secession movements because they could have what they claim to want. They could have it now in their lifetimes. Well, part of the reason that uh, they don't settle just for the secession models because they perceive things as already going in their direction. So it's just a matter of time <laughs> and yes. we'll get everything we want anyway. Maybe it'll take five or 10 years longer, but but that's it. Um, now, of course, if they weren't in power, I think if they didn't have a stranglehold on the universities, on media, on culture, on everything, uh, I can't think of a single institution that uh, right wingers have any sort of serious influence on anything that matters. Uh, so since they control all those institutions that matter, you know, why, why settle for just, just local? Now, of course, it, the savvy thing to do if, if things aren't already going in your direction is, is of course, to move for secession as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, to, that doesn't mean you're giving up. If, if you attain secession, you would then, of course, still attempt to uh, win people over to your point of view uh, and uh, progress outward from there. And, and to a certain extent, the left has used this tactic as well uh, to good effect. Uh, just look at how, and it's mostly been the left, the libertarian movement has been basically useless on this topic, has been the, uh, the legalization of marijuana in Western states. And so now it's, I believe, four Western states. Colorado was the first and, you know, ever since the vote went through, nobody even discusses it anymore. It's just, it's a done deal. Nobody cares. Pot's legal now. Yeah, there are some, um, some mainstream Democrats and some right-wing Republicans who still complain about it a lot and are trying to claim that murder rates are going up or something like that, which they're not. Uh, but for the most part, that won. Now, part of the reason now that the feds aren't moving in and arresting everybody who smokes a joint is because they sense that public opinion is on the side of the drug legalizers. So public opinion matters in this case. The overall ideology of the country matters in this case. And so if things are going in your direction, you can actually speed things up by using the decentralist uh, model as well. The, the anti-Tenth Amendment people, the libertarians that think the Supreme Court will give everybody freedom, were wrong. The, the method of ending the drug war through D.C. has failed. The way that it is being won is through a decentralist nullification model in the states. And so I think there's a lot to learn from what's been done uh, with the marijuana thing. Well, speaking of giving the left what it wants, we have a, a very poignant example this morning after the Brexit vote, I think, and that's Scotland. So Scotland had an opportunity in 2014 to vote for independence from Britain and to become actually more aligned with Brussels and uh, almost undoubtedly would have resulted in Scotland becoming even more left wing and Scotland votes far, much more labor, uh, more left than Westminster generally. So in that vote, the older Scots voted against leaving the UK. Many of them were worried about their pensions, but all of the younger Scots voted for leaving the UK. Well, last night we have almost the opposite results. Scotland overwhelmingly voted against leaving the EU and the irony is that in England, we saw all of the older English folks voting to leave the EU and all the younger English folks wanting to remain. So in, in, a, in some weird ways, it sort of mirrored the Scottish independence vote. But why not give Scotland the opportunity now to go join the EU and be independent of England? And why, 
I, I have to say, UKIP has been hypocritical on this because UKIP opposed uh, the Scottish independence vote, but they supported uh, the, the Brexit vote last evening. So why not use Scotland as a laboratory, as a test case? They've got some oil wealth. They have some very dopey ideas uh, about how society ought to be organized. They're, they're deeply socialist. They're probably equivalent to the Sweden or the Quebec of the UK. But why not give them a chance to align themselves with the EU and go their own way now? Because there's got to be a lot of very unhappy Scots. And the 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 sub question involved in that is why should we as libertarians be concerned if a geographic area like Scotland wants to go off in a, in a decidedly ill libertarian direction as long as we're not forced into it and as long as they're not warring against countries outside their, their borders? Is it really our business or our job as libertarians to want to libertarianize the world? I say no. Well, that's one of the dumber arguments you hear on the secession issue is, oh, the people who want to secede, they have impure motives. So therefore, we have to uh, we have to support continued centralization. We heard this all the time from unionists in Spain uh, on the Catalonia issue. Oh, those Catalonia people, they're such leftists. And I, would we hear the same thing in America if, say, New York tried to secede? Would a bunch of Southerners say, well, those New Yorkers are a bunch of leftists. They have to be kept inside the country. Uh, that that would be terrible. <laughs> so I hope that wouldn't happen. But yeah, of course, Scotland should be allowed uh, to leave. Of course, they should be allowed to go their own way. In fact, boy, did, did some of these UKIP people luck out because when I noticed that Nigel Farage had actually had campaigned vehemently against Scotland leaving, had asked the Queen to intervene to keep Scotland in the country. And then when it looked like the Scotland votes might keep the UK inside the EU, I thought, well, yeah, great, great job there. But uh, he, he lucked out and uh, the UK left anyway. But boy, yeah, what would happen to England if Scotland left? Boy, this would massively slam things in favor of the Tories. And of course, I don't understand UK internal politics very well. So I don't even know what that would mean necessarily. But certainly it would seem it would be in the favor of many English nationalists to get rid of Scotland. So what's the problem? I, I guess nostalgia is a big thing that, oh, they've been in the country for 300 years, so we can't let them go now. Uh, but I don't see the big argument. Otherwise, they're net tax receivers. It would be like you had uh, in the U.S., oh, let's just take a state like uh, West Virginia wanted to leave the union or something. Boy, that would be a net benefit to everybody who pays into Washington, D.C. It would be less of a tax burden for the rest of the country. So I, I just don't see the problem. Right. But we also have to understand this is about the people's interest versus the government's interest, right? Politicians hate to see their turf shrink. So last night, the European Parliament uh, saw the turf over which it purports to govern shrink somewhat. And I think the Queen and most people in Westminster don't want to see Scotland uh, leave the UK for that very point. But Ryan, I want to ask you one last thing as we wrap this up. I'm a little surprised, I must admit, by the Brexit vote, not only that it won, but that it won by the margin it did. And I, and I, I alluded earlier in the show to what does this really mean? Is this really a blow against globalism? Does this bode ill for Hillary and well for Trump? Does this mean nationalist uprisings or at least decentralist uprisings are going to occur all over the world? I will only say this and then I'll leave you to comment. It seems to me that voters are timid folks. Voters tend to be very sheep-like. So let me say this. When things get weird or uneasy or uncomfortable, voters tend to vote for what they know, which would be remain in the UK and Hillary. When things get very weird, uncomfortably weird, they tend to vote for what they don't know, which would be leave Brexit and Trump. So give us your final thoughts on this. What do you think this augurs for November in the U.S.? Well, and you're right. Uh, the ton, a ton of the political science literature says that, yes, uh, people who are who tend to be kind of less educated, uh, they're, they're late voters, they're not very engaged. They tend to go with the status quo because that's what's comfortable. Um, unless, of course, their fears are so heightened, as you say, that they just want to get out. Now, in this case, that doesn't necessarily translate to Trump. I mean, there are some issues there uh, that certainly overlap, right? The issue of nationalism, the idea of being anti-globalist, the, the anti-immigration issue, and so on. Um, I think it's too, still too early to say is this, it's certainly this vote is not bad for Trump. I think we could say that. Uh, will it translate into uh, Americans voting more for him? 
Uh, maybe. In fact, it might even convince some people who are who consider themselves to be reasonable moderate types uh, to even uh, lean a little bit more populist. Because now if, if those reasonable Brits even will do something radical like this, well, then maybe we can do this uh, as well. And so, yeah, definitely not bad for Trump. Could be good for him. Too hard to say. The the big issue in, in the United States is the Electoral College. It leans so heavily in favor of the Democrats. Uh, will Trump be able to overcome that huge obstacle? And uh, that definitely remains to be seen. Well, Ryan, thanks so much for your time. Fascinating topic, fascinating interview. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.